when you're working in the cannabis industry. Thank you, Emmy, for making sure it's recorded for folks that don't get to attend live. <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about when things go wrong. And when you're working in the cannabis and hemp industry, where we're often building the jetliners as we fly it, doing our best to adapt best practices from other industries, whether it's horticulture, food processing, industrial manufacturing, drug manufacturing, you name it, right? Um, there's a ton of stumbles and setbacks that really aggregate and add up over time to wreak havoc on your business long term. And each episode, we present a worst case scenario, something that's you know based in reality that we've seen. Uh, we try to protect the innocent and guilty, um, but then you use that to bring in some trusted experts and advisors. With them, we analyze where things went wrong, talk about GMP best practices, highlight regulations where they apply, and discuss how this all ties back to the benefit of industry standardization. We're also going to offer um, and do our best to offer some tips about doing it right, and we'll hang out to answer your questions. And with that said, I want to just put a plug to, as we go through this webinar discussion, raise your hand, throw stuff in the chat, throw your thoughts and questions and ideas out there. This is a really great opportunity to take the folks that are on the hot seat here, us experts, and get our thoughts and perspectives. So we're here for you. Um, so to kick things off, I want to introduce our experts and good co colleagues of ours at the GMP Collective. And then from there, I'll share a not too uncommon scenario that began with a consumer complaint. And, you know, after all, we produce consumer goods. So let's not forget, without happy and safe customers, we don't have a market to sell to. So our consumers and in many markets, patients are a top priority. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm super excited to bring on Kathleen May and Ed Nodlin. Um, Kathleen is the founder of Triscally Quality Solutions. She also works as a trusted consultant here at GMP Collective. She brings over 20 years of experience um, in CAPA, which is uh, an, one of the industry uh, acronym soups for corrective action, preventive action. She brings aseptic and sterilized equipment qualification and process validation expertise, analytical microbial test method development and validation, and so much more to the cannabis and hemp industry. She's also, I'm proud to have her alongside as our committee chair for ASTM International Committee's D37 on cannabis. <clears throat> Kathleen, welcome to this episode. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> and then followed up by Kathleen, I'm super excited to have Ed, um, Ed Nodlin. He is the founder of Jetstream, sorry, co-founder of Jetstream Innovations, creators of GapCross.com which GapCross enables the translation of business knowledge, standards, and regulations into efficient assessment, procedure, data collection, and training applications. He worked in the Boeing Structural Test Lab for over a decade. He was a Boeing engineering quality in Boeing engineering and quality for 10 years, followed by 20 years working with state, national, and international regulations. He's been around the block a little bit. He's got some experience and wisdom to share. He's been involved with the cannabis regulations and standards since 2016, and is also an executive officer of ASTM International D37 on cannabis, alongside almost, I think we just reached over 1,200 volunteer members, so it's an honor to be part of that. Ed, welcome. It's good to see you, sir. And so I am fortunate to have worked with these uh, individuals on several projects, uh, and initiatives. And I'm really excited to bring you guys all here live for the audience and folks that live on in the YouTube world beyond this live event to learn more about the challenges that we see and how you can really learn from the mistakes of others before you. Because there's no fun in reinventing the wheel, making the same mistake that dozens to hundreds of other folks have probably made as well. So with that said, it's story time. Let's jump into what went wrong. I'm going to put this image out here. While you're getting going, Dave, Go what went wrong was I didn't hit the unmute button when I said, oh, thanks, Dave. Glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> the most innocuous things can add up, right? So perfect example. <laughs> so <clears throat> to jump into what went wrong, let's give this, and I want to give the scenario some justice and ask everyone present to imagine yourselves on a Friday afternoon, maybe it's even a Wednesday afternoon, finish your last meeting for the day went home, you're relaxing, you want to unwind, you grab a package of edibles from your childproof drawer, from your favorite brand, because, you know, let's be realistic, could happen to anyone. And you open it to find, I don't know, something kind of like this. Um, this is uh, full disclosure, this is from Reddit. I don't know the 
brand uh, and whatnot, but whether this is a legal product or not, but this is definitely something I've seen similar in the industry. So you've got, say, 10 pieces of your gummies in the package that are all congealed together. The color might be a little off. It doesn't look as appetizing and relaxing as you were hoping it to. Um, so I don't know about you, but that's that can be a bummer to start your evening or your weekend. Um, so before we jump to the conclusion and blame the consumer for leaving their package, uh, you know, out in the car while they grab some ice cream and ran some errands and went grocery shopping in you know Phoenix in July. Um, is anybody else getting feedback? Or is that just me? I'm getting okay. feedback. Kathleen, it looks like the background noise might be coming from you. Okay. I was mute. I was muted. I think we're good now. We'll keep it. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, <clears throat> so as I was saying, right, you know, let's let's imagine this scenario. It wasn't because we were in downtown Phoenix in the middle of July, leaving this product out in the car. And maybe there's other evidence of this happening before. So imagine that story turns into a customer complaint. So I'm going to kind of wear as moderator hat, <clears throat> I'm going to wear the kind of manager or quality person's role that received this complaint. <clears throat> and before I kick off, I want to put it out to you guys in the audience. So think about from your lens, especially if you're in the cannabis operations uh, side, if you're in manufacturing, on retail, have you seen this before? Um, you know, any thoughts on where you think something could have gone wrong. And there's probably more than one area that could have caused this to happen. So if you wanna throw out any thoughts, questions, or ideas, please do that. And we'll uh, use that to interact into the space. Um, Blake, why don't, yeah, if you, and that said, you wanna raise your hand too and speak up, please uh, come on stage and do so. So yeah, I'll do my best to moderate that. Blake, I'll let you start off and then we'll kick it over to Kathleen. Well, just in my experience, there's two major issues that I'm observing. One is, um, water activity and too much water activity. The other one is formulation and not heat stabilized using something to, um, for heat stability for shelf life. You guys are awesome. Thanks, Blake. And I think Alexa, thanks for chiming in. Um, I'll just re, uh, I'll just restate the chat. Um, uh, Alexa noted that she's found that more gelatin based gummies will melt easier since they need a lower ambient temperature. So I think there's some really good points right there. So with that said, let's pause and kick it over to Kathleen. Um, help me understand what's the big deal? What's the problem? Uh, so, you know, the first step in, in doing any type of investigation, I mean, obviously a lot of you um, in the industry, you know, just from those last two comments, you've seen this before. So you, you have a pretty good understanding of of maybe why it's happening. Um, but a key component to you know, conducting that investigation is documenting um, your findings. So even though you may know what the issue is, um, there is a process, you know, uh, David mentioned the CAPA, corrective action, preventive action. There is a process in which you have to you know, um, document what you're finding, even if you already know the answer um, upfront or initially, you need to get all that information documented. So the first step is really defining the problem. And um, we, in, in the capital world, we call that, you know, defining a problem description or a problem statement. And there's typically, you know, like five questions you need to ask in that problem description. The who, like who identified the issue? What, what was the problem? In this case, you know, it's you know, the gummies uh, or the product sticking together. When did the issue, um, not necessarily when it occurred, but when it was identified or when it was brought to the attention of you know, when was that customer complaint logged or, you know, if this is being identified, say, even on the manufacturing floor, you know, who identified it? When was it identified? Um, so the who, what, when, uh, where, you know, was it a particular dispensary? Um, was it a particular manufacturing line? All of that. And then what's the scope? You know, what's the magnitude of the issue? Um, in this case, as David mentioned, we, we kind of already know going into this that it is a product complaint. Was it one product complaint? Was it multiple product complaints? Was it from multiple dispensaries? So all of those questions together, answering those questions, you define your problem description, and then that allows you to scope the investigation, um, which will help 
Um, Because a lot of times what happens with CAPAs is is you have what's called scope creep. So you get into the investigation and then you're like, oh, well, this also happened, maybe related, maybe completely unrelated. So it's it's a, um, there's a tendency to, before you know it, you're investigating 14 different issues when in reality, it's that one issue that you need to address. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. I'll, I'll add to that, you know, some background for context to build out the scenario. We've got, say, um, so in this scenario, we've got 17 different um, complaints that all went back to the manufacturer across three dispensaries. So I think it's fair to say that we're, we're still brainstorming, but we're tracking in terms of what um, Blake and Alexa put out there as maybe it's going, goes back to the manufacturing line and, and ingredients, but we don't want to jump to conclusions, right? So we want to make sure we're doing that brainstorming exercise and really thinking through it. And so, Ed, well, uh, I don't know that you're an edibles guru, though um, I haven't had dinner with you yet, or you haven't had me over for dinner yet. Um, so maybe you secretly are. What are your thoughts and, you know, any perspective? Well, you don't you have can... to be a, you don't have to be an edibles guru or a medical device guru or an aircraft guru, you know, because I got 10 years, 11, 21 years with Boeing to basically know the process of getting after a problem, you know, it, it could be in your family, you know, just a home problem. You want to get after that. So had a couple of really good uh, suggestions, you know, the obvious things that would go wrong from Alexa and from Blake, but what happens when you go out and you look at that and that appears to be the problem and you make that fix and five months later, you're getting those complaints back in again. So you check your fix and you're going like, yeah, the fix is there. Maybe that wasn't really the problem, you know? So you found, you thought you found the problem and there was indications that it was the problem, but it really wasn't. And that, that gets back to what Kathleen said. Now you're scrambling around going like, who did that investigation? What did we find? What did we do? What lots was it? And if you haven't documented that, you're basically starting from scratch again. And so, you know, getting, getting that information and capturing it is really key to, to moving forward with that. I, yeah, I think that's really important just to remind everybody, and this is, I think, something we see a lot too, of maybe we think we know the conclusion or we know the issue and root cause and we kind of jump into that, but what documentation are we doing? And without that, did this happen three months ago? Was this a fluke? Is it something that happens every July? Like, Back to Kathleen, your point, like, what's the extent of the magnitude? Who, what, where, when did it happen? And if we don't have any of that data documented, then depending on where you are in the organization, it's really easy to be like, oh, this is just so-and-so that, you know, oversaw this and we're just going to put a quick fix on it. And reality is it's a little bit deeper than that. Um, Kathleen, do you have any more thoughts to add and then, or Ed, and then I'll go to Blake. with Yeah, I'll just add a little bit to that, you know, and I'm not a big one on you have to follow this regimented laborious process of documenting stuff and you know 18 signatures and buy off and get it all filed i'm happy if it's scribbled on a napkin as long as you can find that napkin when you need to you know and you need a system to do that so i'm not i'm not throwing out systems and good procedure but you need a good process to capture the key information you're going to need and uh and when you do when you do go back and look at your records and you're going you know we're we had that information six months ago, but we didn't record it. You ought, to, you ought to be documenting someplace in your process that this is the type of information we need to record again. So, so we don't have that as a failure, you know, your record keeping, you know, that, that's another system where things can fail. I just want to comment on um, just to kind of piggyback off of Ed and then we can go to Blake, but um, Ed mentioned, you know, um, I don't want to say making assumptions, but, you know, throwing out those potential root causes and then maybe jumping to a conclusion and maybe making an assumption that something isn't um, a root cause. So if you're throwing root causes or potential root causes out there, um, you know, you have your laundry list of um, of things that you that you established as part of a brainstorming session. Some of those things, you know, you can probably, you know, take off the list. based on, you know, further review of the process and and whatnot. But if you are making a determination or you're making a claim that, um, you know, any one of those potential root causes could have caused the issue, then you need to make sure that you've taken that through the process, 
you've investigated it and you have objective evidence to rule it out or rule it in. So like Ed was saying is, you know, when you don't do that and then further along in the investigation, you realize that one of those things that you prematurely negated as a potential root cause, well, now you're either going to have to go back and reinvestigate that, or you don't have the objective evidence to prove one way or the other. So if you're putting potential root causes out there, just make sure you're doing your due diligence to investigate and, and ensure that you have some sort of, sort of, of objective evidence to either rule it in or rule it out. Thanks, Eileen. Yeah, Blake, go ahead, sir. <clears throat> I hope I'm not jumping ahead um, with the investigative part, but drawing conclusions, you covered the who, what, when, where, or the who, what, when, where. Um, when you go to the why and you start researching, and I just wanted to give you some hypotheticals here. So if I looked at it and said, this is a water activity concern, and I um, investigate that and find what is my proper water activity, I take that corrective action. And now I've implemented that, but I didn't actually address the formulation issue. Well, where does it become scope creep? Or do you do two corrective actions? Or do you do like one report and then you have different responses where I'm investigating this, I'm saying it's water activity and formulation, or is one of them water formulation and then another one is, I'm sorry, water activity and the other one is addressing formulation. Like where, where do you draw those lines at so you don't have scope creep or is that all within the scope of product stability? Yeah, and let, let me throw something out there and then Kathleen, I know you've got some thoughts, I think. Um, so one would be the concept of, and I see this a lot too, you know, think about the scientific process of like change one variable at a time so you can understand your outcome and your shift. And so even you use the example of water activity or is it moisture or temperature? If that's the issue, let's go back and ask the question. Did you define what acceptable water activity was to begin with? Do you have that data? Did you collect that data? Because without having done that beforehand, you're at a, you're at a disadvantage of being able to even conclude, right? Conclusively that that was the issue. <clears throat> I think that's an important point to think about. And then I hope this chimes into Kathleen's, uh, where Kathleen may be going, um, to your point, Blake, right, of you know, changing multiple things. So is it an ingredient issue? Is it a water activity issue? Is it an environmental issue? If you try to change all three things at once, <clears throat> which one did all three of them solve it? How do you verify that it, what, which, which was the real problem? So I'll pause there, Kathleen. Yeah, so Blake, you're actually covering like two different aspects of the investigation. One is the, the problem description in which you're defining, you know, that last why is the scope or the magnitude. The other part of that is the, or that you mentioned is the actual investigation, right? And digging into root cause. I will point out that, you know, there are times that problem description is created, you know, on the onset of the identification of the, of the issue. So there's a lot of information you don't know at that point, right? So, you know, you know, the basics, um, there are times it's, it's, I would say rare that you would go back and, and update that problem description, but that can happen if, you know, if you identify different issues that scope, um, or I should say additional root causes, that scope answer or question could change is probably part of your problem description. But um, the bigger thing is when you do an investigation, you may have multiple root causes. Um, you know, there may be, and you may individually rule out, um, you know, root causes as, as the cause, but collectively, you know, together, maybe those multiple things could have created that, that, um, that issue or that event. So, but it's, it's in my experience, um, doing CAPA, there's only been a few times that I've done an investigation where we have definitively found the root cause. Oftentimes it's um, potential, you know, multiple potential root causes or contributing factors, which is fine. You just need to make sure that any one of those um, root causes has an associated correction, corrective action or preventive action. So it's okay to have multiple root causes as part of, as part of the investigation. Go ahead, Ed, yeah. Yeah, lots of times, you know, you, you get those multiple causes and you, you think you have it on one, but really it's something that stacks up. And I was talking with David and 
Kathleen earlier this week, and I said, yeah, it sort of reminds me of the 737 MAX 8 that was grounded for years. And that that was, you know, there was a lot of root causes to go all the way back to the desire to have low cost flight, you know, and everybody's trying to push that. Uh, FAA oversight was a big one. Uh, the training wasn't there. Communication with the airlines on some new technology that was going in wasn't there. And so the part itself that, that was causing the problem would not have caused the planes to come down if it wasn't for all these other compounding events that happened. Turns out a little bit of everything went into all those different areas of problem. And, you know, FAA now takes different oversight and the training and, you know, it's just, and so you'll find that uh, as far as, as, you know, do you, do you do that, change one variable at a time or not? That depends on how, how much of a scientific approach is justified. You know, if, if you want to really know what caused that, because you have other products that may have similar uh, results, you know, similar failures, but they don't all have the same components and formulation and stuff. You sort of got to narrow that down and do some scientific statistical uh, analysis of that. On the other hand, if you can change three things and now you don't have that problem and you haven't had complaints in the last two years, you know, you don't really want to spend all that time doing scientific study. So, you, you know, I could get into details, but really you need that specific situation. And then I might uh, recommend one approach or the other as a way to go. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, and I think if you dig into it, right, is it fair to go down the whole of, you know, asking a couple more questions about, so, you know, fix a couple of the things that were brought up in the chat is about like the packaging, right? Like is a, is a potential certain type of bag a, a solution? And if you think about that, let's go back to, let's look at the supply chain and there's the food scientists, there's the production folks on the line that are actually working day in and day out. Does the person that's making a purchase to say, we have to buy these bags, how specific did we define that? <clears throat> so all of a sudden, maybe you were using X bag and then cost comes in, right? That's so so common about, we're trying to do this at the lowest cost. So, oh, it's a, it's a sealable bag. It's hermetically sealed. It, you know, it's got, you know, is it PTFE? What's the, what's the product type? It's food safe, food grade. Good to go, right? What's the issue? Do we, maybe we didn't define the mill thickness, the permeability, et cetera. And so did, did, is it possible that somebody just ordered a new type of bags because it still met the spec of a similar type, looks the same, but now that's part of the issue. And you know, how do you, you know, start diving into those issues where you haven't defined the specifications to begin with to confirm that, or even you know, what type of sugar, what type of pectin, um, you know, those issues where, because we didn't, define that specifically and validate that that was the right type under the right conditions. Those are some other, I guess, potential areas. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, uh, Kathleen, or let you go first and then Ed, maybe. Yeah, I think as this conversation continues, you know, we're going to identify um, systems like Ed mentioned earlier that may be deficient or lacking um, Whereas if those processes and procedures were in place, um, not to say that this event wouldn't happen, there's, you know, nothing ever runs 100% smooth, even if you have the best GMP program in your facility, um, things happen. And it, it would be odd if your facility didn't have issues, you know, that, that to me is more of a red flag when I go in and do an audit, you know, if I'm told, you know, yeah, we haven't had any CAPAs or issues. That's odd to me. <laughs> you typically, you know, facilities have problems. You just don't want to have a million problems, you know, that you're dealing with at any one time. So in this case, or in that example, that would be, you know, reviewing your um, your supplier vendor qualification and even your inspection criteria for your raw materials and components. Um, we don't talk about this a lot, or we haven't talked about this a lot, but when you purchase materials or even like tools that you're going to use in your manufacturing area, you should be doing some level of a risk assessment, you know, based on the materials of construction, you know, of that um, tool or the, um, you know, the components, you know, how they, you know, what, what's in them and, you know, and look at that in comparison to your manufacturing area. 
is it clean? You know, if you are in an area or if you're manufacturing, say in an ISO clean room, which most aren't, but some are, um, or even just keeping it clean or controlled, are you potentially bringing in contaminated material because there's no requirements from the manufacturer to um, ensure that the bio burden levels are, are low in that material. So doing that upfront initial or that upfront risk assessment on what you're actually bringing into the facility um, is, is good practice and should be part of your, of your um, not only just your supplier vendor qualification, but also your requirements on, on material inspection. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. Um, I've got some thoughts about risk assessments I'd like to throw out there, but um, I don't know, Ed, do you have anything first before I jump in? Yeah, I'll just add something too. When when you're brainstorming, you know what might be the problem, switch it around and ask the question: What could we do to cause this problem? And brainstorm that because now you're going to get people saying, you know, sink it to the bottom of a lake. You know, put it in the sun, bad packaging, you know, I mean, you just you just start coming up with this big list of things. Now that you have that list, now you can come back and say, OK, what are the possibilities here that we think we might want to investigate? Because when you just go, what's the problem? You're sort of limited because your, your mind is just instantly drilling down on the obvious things that are there. So, you know, first of all, brainstorm, how could we cause this? And. You know, it, it just opens up, opens up that, that space and, and ideas. If I could just comment before you jump into risk assessments, David. Um, brainstorming, like Ed said, like, don't limit yourself. Like, literally, I mean, we've done sessions where we're in a room with, a, with everyone has a, a, a pack of post-it notes. And it's literally just brainstorming any possibility that, even if it sounds completely ridiculous, you know, those are the ones that you can then eventually take off your list but throw everything out there because you'd be surprised. Sometimes the most odd thing that you throw out there as a potential root cause ends up being the root cause. So don't hold back, like throw all the ideas out, out there, um, even if you think they're not possible or completely ridiculous sounding. Take that opportunity during that brainstorming session. Yeah, thanks Kathleen. I think, you know, to tie in brainstorming and the concept of a risk assessment, I see a lot of folks say, what, I have to risk everything? I have to assess everything? That sounds like a pain in the butt and so much work. And then I've even seen folks, you know, where it's like, well, how far and deep do you go, right? I mean, the risks, you can easily go down lots of rabbit holes, right? But think about the idea of brainstorming, as you mentioned. There's no bad ideas. Until you get those out on the table, you don't even know how to categorize and evaluate them. Once you have them on the table, and I think, you know, Ed, I'll, I'll bring back to earlier, you brought up the, you know, Boeing example, and sure, you're not an aircraft um, engineer, uh, but there is a cross-functional team having the different perspectives, having folks that understand food science here, that uh, none of us three are those experts um, to the table to balance all that. That's what gives a good brainstorming session, right? And you do that both during the investigation for a Kappa when you have a problem, and you do that ideally proactively when you're evaluating your ingredients or your process ahead of time. And so think about it as simple as it's a brainstorming exercise. And once you get that on the table, you can start looking at it and chipping away process of elimination. Well, that's a low risk. We know why that's not happen. That's not possible. And we're going to, we're going to de-risk it, right? We're not going to throw it away, but we're going to say that's not, that's a low risk or in that we're going to say, yeah, that is a high risk. So here's the decisions we're going to make to evaluate and control that risk. And it's it's just a process, right? It's a simple methodical process that you can then refer back to later and say, oh yeah, I thought about this and here's why we made our decisions so that when you have an issue here today, we have data to look back on instead of, well, I think uh, Kathleen talked about that six months ago, but oh, Kathleen's no longer with the company anymore. So her institutional knowledge is gone. And I don't have any idea why we chose this bag or made the specification. And that that really, there's a lot of dead ends, right? That can happen without having that stuff, those documentation, those procedures up ahead of time. <laughs> and if you establish, a, a, if, you, if you do the risk assessment up front, like even before you decide to start manufacturing or, you know, if you have a HACCP plan, you can actually use that document to, to go back to, right? And, and to start ruling some things out because you have, you've done the work up front to identify um, those risks or those hazards. 
So those documents are great to have as a tool, even when you're going through an investigation, because you've done that, you know, that exercise of determining, um, you know, what things could potentially cause certain situations in, in, in your facility. You may, you're probably not gonna have everything in there, but it's, it's at least a tool that you can, you can leverage. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, and I say you come off mute. Go, go ahead, sir. Love to hear you. Yeah, thoughts. the uh, you know the whole thing on risk. You know, you're not you're not going to get this bad. You know, the first time you you see that bag of gummies all melted together, you're not going to jump in and do a three week analysis and you know all that stuff. <clears throat> you're probably going to say you're you're probably going to go after some of that obvious stuff and see what's going on. And if you find something. You're going to pat yourself on the back and say it's fixed. But if that thing comes back and, and stuff, you know, you got to dig in a little more. Now, even on that first fix, though, you should always ask yourself, and, and I'm a believer, you should have a thought process documented that says, you know, ask these questions when we fix something. You know, and one of them is, what's the risk if this doesn't fix the problem? You know, and if it's people are going to die, you better go a little deeper. If it's, yeah, we might have to throw another lot away, you know, that goes bad. If it's not that big of a thing to you cost-wise, you know, give it a try. And, but you, you always want to be looking at that risk of what's the, what's the chance of this happening? And if it does, what does that mean to us? And as, as you get, as it gets more complex and you say, you know, we've tried three things. We're a year into this and and we keep getting a certain percentage of the batches this happens to, and we can't find out why. You know, now you got to get more scientific about this, and you really got to start pulling out a lot of these tools we've been talking about to really weed out all the potential things that could be going wrong so that you can make those fixes and have a reliable, stable process running. You know, Ed, you kind of um, brought up a point I wanted to pivot us to. So thank you for bringing us there. And then I, I've got a good question from the audience as well that I'll I'll go to in a second. Um, but you know, this all sounds, let's just be real. This is work, right? You've got to actually take the time to sit down and document this. You've got to get the process in place. You've got to collect the data. And work means time. Time means money, right? So I, I see that as a major barrier. What's why, why would we do this? Like, what's the incentive? What's the... How do we tie this back to the, the ROI? Like, how does this make anybody that's here, if you're on the production floor, how does this make, how does this investment of a little bit of time up front or actually doing the thorough investigation when you're already working overtime and just don't have, don't feel like you have the time? And then if you're, you know, you're a leader, you're in the C-suite or you're your director, general manager, why, why would you do this? What's the benefit? Um, any thoughts there talking about like the cost of quality or, yeah. Ed, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go? Sure, I can jump in on that one. <laughs> um, but my story, again, it goes back to Boeing and the structural test lab. And, and it was back when they first started their quality stuff. And it was in engineering, you know, you don't have, you can't, you can't measure holes and, and rivets and things like that, you know, scientifically in the engineering space. But the chief engineer of the structural test lab wanted to embrace this fully. And we had processes for how he conducted his weekly meetings with his direct reports. We had processes for how you introduce something. We had processes for how they'd make a decision. Somebody would bring something up. And at first we're really clumsily stepping through this process. But after about four, five, six months, it became a way of thinking. And at that point, we quit looking at those diagrams very rarely did we have to update them. Once in a while, we had to go back and look at that. And, you know, they were decision process. They were decision processes, really. But management could have something come up on their plate and they could get through and triage that and say, this person has to go work that. It's out of the meeting. We're not going to discuss it here. Just boom, boom, you know, and they're fitting through that. And that's where you can reduce that cost. You're still doing the same work, but you're not stumbling through it. Each time you do it, you, you just you, you, it just becomes very efficient. And so I'm really big on just, you know, getting your process down and making sure that everybody follows that and, 
and get that efficiency going. I'll add to that. So David and Ed probably too has heard me say this a number of times, pay for it now or pay for it later. You know, you, if you invest the time to, to investigate root cause correctly and you implement appropriate corrective actions, again, not saying that the issue won't come back because like we said earlier, sometimes, you know, we're, we're kind of shooting in the dark. We might have three potential root causes and, and, and maybe we chose wrong, right? But more times than not, um, when you implement appropriate corrective actions and you have solid effectiveness checks, that issue doesn't return. If you jump, jump to judgment or you, know, you put a Band-Aid on the problem or you only address the symptoms of the issue, there's a high probability that that issue is going to come back. And CAPAs take time and they, they cost money because you're pulling resources away from um, doing their daily job, like manufacturing product, which obviously that's how you make money. Um, you know, I'll give an example as well, and this is more on the microbiological side, but I worked for a company that um, they got an FDA inspection and they got a 483 because they had multiple sterility and uh, sterility failures. And it was a recurring issue because they never fully got to where, you know, the, the, the microorganisms were coming from. So it just, it just compounded. And before you knew it, they had eight sterility failures and they didn't know like even where to start because it was just mad chaos and they eventually had to shut down. So now they're not making any product. Um, so they were out of manufacturing for months because of this issue. Um, and FDA inspectors in particular, any auditor, you know, one of the things they look at when they come into your facility, you know, well, the first thing I ask for is show me a list of your open cap as your open deviations or NCRs. And if I see things that are recurring, that's a red flag for me, because that means they didn't do a correct root cause investigation to get to the, the problem or to fix the problem. And they're just putting band-aids on, on, on the issue. So that takes time, money, and resources away from what you know what you want to do is, is manufacture product and make money. So take the time up front. Um, again, you may not get it, you know, 100% every single time, but more times than not, if you do that investigation correctly and you implement appropriate corrective actions, and I don't know if we're going to really get into like effectiveness checks because I could go on and on about that, because that's really where you're you're really evaluating if those corrective actions were correct and they actually worked. Um, if you do that process right, the likelihood of that issue coming back is is pretty low. Oh, I think I'll I'll take what you just said and run with that and to put put it as a kind of a question to the audience to think about like with the costs. So if you don't do this, then who has any data as a company, no matter where you are in the organization, and especially if you're reporting to or working with on the financial side, if you've got a PL responsibility, what is the cost of those labor hours that all added up? What's the cost of all that rework? What's the cost of the products that you're throwing away? And what's the cost of your brand? If you don't have, and then you can't use that to defend and say, look, I made this improvement. We spent this time and look at the ROI, look at the return on the investment. And this is so critical to have to defend yourself and to be able to show improvement. So I think that's a really important you know, concept to think about of not having this data, not taking the time to collect it. You have no idea where you're going and how well it's working. And um, yeah, I guess I'll kind of pause. I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say on that is the recall, you know, recall. I mean, there's, you can look at some great multi-state operators. You can look at what that impact is. You know, you talked about Kathleen and the FDA coming in. Well, we don't have the FDA most for the most part here in Canada. We've got Health Canada, but any state and en en entity comes into play. You have to have a product withdrawal. You get a health advisory if you're in Colorado. What's that brand reputation going to cost you? And now you've all of a sudden got the regulators a little more close to you. You know, they, there's only so many so many resources they all have. So you want to be their friend, and you want them to when they show up. It's more of a hey, just checking in, not a well. You're already on our radar because you've already made a couple of mistakes, and we don't have confidence in you. <clears throat> all of a sudden, that adds a lot of cost, time, and stress, and and that's really quantifiable. So you don't want to have that issue. You don't want to have the recall. You don't want to be that person that's responsible from a brand standpoint. I'll 
I'll pause my diatribe so, there. Go ahead. So, Ed. David, what you're what you're what you're saying is, you don't want to have the situation where you have the cost numbers that you can, the, the the penalty numbers that you can have to compare against your cost numbers. Yeah, no, you wanna you wanna avoid that. Yeah, exactly. And I'll I'll use this as an opportunity. Um, Blake, I see you get your hand raised. Hold on one second. Um, I'll go to Steve Wyland. I think you brought up something really good in the uh, in the chat. So. You asked, um, you put out there, I think this is a point of sale package of edible gummies. Um, is this something handed to a consumer? Your, your, your question is about you know, where the product labeling is, including recommended storage conditions. And um, Alexa, you, thanks for sharing, you know, good point. That depends on the state. <clears throat> and one thing that I wanna use that as an opportunity to say is you can do the bare minimum of what your state requires. Most states, yeah, don't. I just worked on a Colorado work task group about you know, shelf stability and, you know, test expiration. And well, what data do we have? Nobody's required to put the expiration, uh, an expiration date on there. Nobody's required to do a, a shelf stability study. Nobody's saying, defining what ambient conditions are in most of the industry, but is that, that is setting you up for failure. And I say this a lot to clients. I'm like, I'm sorry that the state agency or the regulators or legislators set you up for failure by not saying you should do this. Don't you, but don't use that as an excuse because there are plenty of best practices that putting that in place, understanding that and evaluating, you know, optimal relative humidity, transportation conditions is a critical thing to avoid this without, without that information, you don't have any grounds to go back on. So um, I think it's a really important point that you made Alexa to the fact that, yeah, every state's different in terms of what has to be on your packaging. Um, and, and Dave, I'll just add real quick something yeah. about this industry. You know, it's it's just getting started. Um, yeah. After working for Boeing, I got into regulations and I worked with state, federal and international regulations with hazardous material shipping. And geez, when I started working with the DOT regulations, the EPA regulations and OSHA, it was very active. And there was a lot of change. And then then they went through about five or six years of wordsmithing. And it was very active. Things had finally settled down after, because all those regulations really got put in place in the late 60s. Settled down, they got into wordsmithing. And all of a sudden, my workload was going down for the part that I was playing with those things, because things got stabilized. But it took 20 years or so. And then with, with hazardous material shipping, along came lithium batteries. You know, And that, that was just a big uproar. There were some others that weren't as big, but lithium batteries is still a big issue. And there were planes that burnt up with lithium batteries in them, you know? Yep. And so the cannabis industry is rather new. Standards are still being developed, uh, methods, labeling requirements, expiration stuff. It's, it's not in the US, you know, it's not there at the federal level yet. And so, yeah, this is, this is early. And you wanna, you wanna be a leader in this, in this uh, industry by a successful leader not one that helps the rest of the industry find out what not to do. Yeah. I don't want that as your reputation. I just want to make Go ahead, one, Kathleen, point yeah. to, one point to Steve's question. That would be one of those things that you put on that post-it note, right? You put it on the wall. That could be a potential uh, reason why this happened because either there's uh, no label that provides any guidance on storage conditions or the label is deficient in the information or the product was stored incorrectly, either at the dispensary or um, by the consumer. Even it could even be, you know, stored incorrectly at the manufacturing site before it goes out for distribution. Um, you know, worked with a number of, of facilities that don't have um, requirements for temperature humidity in their warehouse. So that would be one of those, you know, brainstorming ideas that you could throw out there and investigate for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I'd love to go to Alexa since uh, you haven't, uh, I know you've chatted a couple of times, but you haven't gotten a chance to speak. So yeah, go ahead. Thank you, David. Um, I think that until we have a national standards for this industry and directions for these operators, I think you're going to continue to see a challenge. Um, I agree with Ed, we're just beginning. This is the time to do it. Um, but in addition to needing national compliance and standards, you're gonna find that there's quite a disconnect between not only the processors and the chemists and lab people who are making this product and understand the complexity 
and what's needed to maintain it. And then you have to imagine it goes into the packaging and the testing, right? And then the salesperson goes out and sells to the dispensaries and they bring the product to the bud tender and the bud tender has no idea and they're not, they're not supposed to take ownership and do that. And then you've got multiple dispensaries that put their compliance stickers onto the side of the containers or they just throw them in the bags and every state's different. Um, so it, it, that's a lot of information, but I think it can be simple. It can be spelled out as a process, a step in the communication. And I think that really just comes with the maturation of the industry. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree more. And I'm going to, I'm going to refrain from going on to, uh, you've got the chair and vice chair here and, uh, uh, and our uh, record um, membership secretary for the standards organization uh, volunteer effort. Uh, so I'll pause on nerding out on that rabbit hole, but it's <laughs> such an important point. Um, with the interest of time, I want to make sure I'm going to pause here and pivot us to just one more recap about the solution, and then we'll um, save about five minutes and maybe we can stick on a little more depending on uh, the the discussion that folks want to bring up. We've got a couple more questions, so. Um, thank you for that. Let me just uh, kind of wrap it up with a sponsor uh, acknowledgement. And this ties into the solution, right? So let's think about the process and the questions you're asking. And when you're looking at during your investigation, the data collection, Do, was a certain step missed, right? Did we actually measure water activity? Did we, you know, do we even have that in our procedure to measure water activity? what what was the issue, right? And so think about how do you track that, right? As Ed, you said, you know, there's plenty of different software, there's many different ways to do it. It's just important to get a process. And then you can use tools and systems to actually put yourself on, you know, supercharge your operation and make it easier so that when we're doing the investigation, you're not sifting through a, a ton of paper from records that you hope you have the data from when that happened. So I wanted to um, highlight, I've gotten to know the group at Pro Canada pretty well over the last, um, geez, it's been it's only been about a year now, I guess, but it's been a good year that we've run into each other quite a bit. So I'm excited to have them as one of the sponsors and just showcasing one of their examples with their software that's, you know, ties into the regulations, which we just talked about the complexity of if you're in multiple states, you have different regulations to adhere to. How do you link that to your process? And then how do you use the checklist? How do you use checklists to actually verify that you've actually done the protocols that you've established. And one cool thing that I was appreciative for Didi to point out here is one unique tool that they have within their checklist is timestamps, right? So the other issue that we see is, you know, you write it in an Excel sheet or you just check it off. When did it happen? You know, it's so easy to have a good idea about a checklist go wrong where Ed gets back to his office, his desk after he does his, his job for the day and he sits down and he just checks off. Yeah, of course I did all those things versus doing it in real time, right? And that's a basic good documentation practice. So one cool feature is that it actually has a timestamp in there. So you can look at when did they do that? And that can be good party investigation to look for, you know, ways where we all get sloppy as humans. It's easy to take shortcuts and take the path of least resistance and just check things off without actually doing it. And so I just wanted to highlight that as a really cool tool um, and part of the solution. Um, and with that said, I'll kind of pivot it back to Kathleen, I don't know if you had anything you want to add there, and then um, and go to Ed for concluding thoughts before we uh, go to our final Q and A. I don't think so. I think you covered you covered it. Ed, any final yeah, I, thoughts? I agree. We'll leave more time for some Q and A here. Fair enough. So, um, yeah. With that said, um, let's switch over to Q and A, and um, just to remind everybody, and we'll be putting the registration link in the chat. If you liked this, uh, kind of a spoiler alert to what um, Jackie, you were talking, you mentioned earlier, the supply chain, that is a deep can of worms. And we're going to do our best to bring in, and we've got an expert, we've got a cannabis uh, operator as well. And we're going to have a really fun conversation the same time next month to talk about issues in the supply chain and how that ties back into demand forecasting and your bottom line and just business fundamentals that take you from a startup into, you know, maturation of you know, a big kid company. Um, let's just, you know, we're a growing, evolving industry and standards are a key part of that equation. So I'll pause there and, um, you know, acknowledge that I hope everybody found value in our root cause discussion and recognizing that this is a tool in the process and the foundational, um, you know, um, these foundational procedures are so important in documentation, just brainstorming, right? Like don't overwhelm yourself. It's 
just brainstorming. If that's all you get out of this and use brainstorming and documenting your process, you're a big step ahead of where you were before. So don't overcomplicate it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pause from my diatribe and go back to, I think we had uh, Blake and then uh, Robert Thomas had a comment. So Blake, I'll let you jump in first. Oh, I put it in the chat and it was kind of pertinent to where you were at and then we got way off of it. Ah. But the consumer trust in the marketplace and how that affects everyone and a loss of consumer trust in the marketplace can mean a marketplace retraction of millions, billions of dollars. And that affects regulators, tax revenue, that affects individual business operators and affects the consumer with what products are available to them in the market. Quality and safety create consumer trust or are directly linked to it. So how all these things work together, the shared responsibility of creating standards, implementing standards, maintaining good practices, all of the documentation, this body of knowledge to create a culture of safety is what builds value in the marketplace. And that's the tide that we all rise together on. I, I love it, Blake. I could not agree more. I think that builds off of Alexa's statement about the importance for standards. And I, I don't think anybody would disagree. How else do you ensure a safe supply chain without standards? How do you protect your brand without it? Um, and I think that ties into Robert Thomas's um, Robert Thomas's statement here or question about um, you know uncovering 15 over 15 uh, Robert Thomas you noted that you've uncovered over 15 consumer product recalls for heavy metals being over the state's regulated limits. How does how the heck does this happen? My words. I and mean, what is the recourse for that happening? And I think that comes back to you know, standards, lack of accountability. There's a lot of issues. We could probably root cause that all day long as well. Um, I don't know, Kathleen or Ed, if you have any, I'll kind of ping to you, Kathleen, first, and then Ed, if you want to chime in on either of those comments. Yeah, I, I think that we could have a, a long conversation just on that comment alone, Robert. Um, I mean, we could even dig into variability and in test methods, right? And the whole conversation around test method validation and where there's gaps in that process and even the gaps with the ISO accreditation process and, and you know, GMP or GLP. So there's, there's a number of things that um, could, you know, be causing that, that problem. As far as recourse, um, again, that comes down to how the states are, are managing that and, and what actions they're taking, right, to, um, to hold these people accountable that, you know, is it a slap on the wrist, but they can continue to manufacture, they can continue to test. You know, every state I've seen, um, you know, it's not consistent by any means on how, how, um, how people are held accountable or how, what actions are taken in situations like that. Yeah, and when you, when you look at state regulations, you know, a lot of them point the health department regulations and some of the health department regulations point to federal FDA regulations and you got to follow those rabbit holes to get to the end of it. And lots of times you end up with something that it's, it's a nice statement. You know, you got to be trained to know what you're doing. Okay. What does that mean? You got a lot of interpretation, you know, it's, it, it, it there's still a lot of room in there to interpret this and it's different from state to state. So if you're a multi-state operator, you have your hands full with all this stuff. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, so any final thoughts? I want to, as we wrap up here, I'll kind of leave it out for anybody to throw any last thoughts in the comments bubble, but uh, on the comments chat uh, box. But otherwise, I just wanted to start by thanking you both, Kathleen, Ed, and of course, everybody here for showing up, taking the time and joining us today. Um, I know that te my team here at the GMP Collective has dropped a couple links in the chat. So feel free to follow and connect with us. If you have any questions that we weren't able to answer tonight, you wanna to discuss this further, you wanna figure out how to take the problems that you have in your own operation and start to use these tools in a way that actually benefits you in the long term and positions you uh, into the future with standardization, give us a shout. Um, we also listed the GMP Collective's email so that you can uh, direct your questions uh, to us. And of course, don't forget to register for episode three coming up on when things go wrong, where, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about all sorts of things in the supply chain and how that ties back to just your basic business fundamentals. And it's all about your ROI and making your business sustainable, scalable, and safe and with a, you know, with a strong brand reputation. So I hope this is a really invaluable 
tool and exercise with brainstorming. And again, thank you so much, Kathleen and Ed. I appreciate you guys all being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you, David. We look forward to your feedback and I hope to see you all next month. So with that, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday afternoon or evening. Take care, everybody.